I then almost was about to pack it in until I decided to do the one thing that I never thought about doing, which is actually something I did before, which is ask for help through my therapy. Why are there successful people out there, Ibrahim? There are successful entrepreneurs in property, in business, in any industry. So when people say, oh, I'm, this industry is not profitable or bullshit, any industry is profitable. There are successful people in any industry. Why? It's because they've got a something that you haven't. So why not learn from them? So put away the books, put away YouTube, put away Google, and actually start speaking to people that actually are doing what you're doing in whatever industry you're doing, and that are still doing it and smashing it. And that's what I did. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Need to Succeed podcast. And this is a podcast where we bring on really successful, phenomenal entrepreneurs and just try to really understand, like, how did they get their success? Because oftentimes what happens is two people go through the exact same situation. One person decides because of this situation, they are going to become wildly successful. And another person says because of that situation, it's actually going to stop them from achieving the success that they want to achieve in their lives. Now, what is the difference between these two mindsets? That's exactly what we look to uncover on this podcast. And today, I have got an absolutely incredible guest. I have got a gentleman who was the entrepreneur of the year just this last year. He is a business mentor, a multiple award-winning public speaker. And this is someone who believes that people are a car crash waiting to happen. And he should know because he's actually been involved in one. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming onto the Need to Succeed podcast, Mr. Hodge Garley. Ibrahim, my brother, it's a, I'm just glad to be here. Thank you for having me, brother. Honestly, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here, my friend. I am looking forward to this conversation. Likewise, um, man. I know if it goes the way that I believe it will, though, um, that it's really going to inspire a lot of people, you know, and really shake people to understand, like, you mm. know, this is what's happened to other people, and look at where they are not. This is something that can happen for yourself as well. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this, my brother. Likewise, man. Thank you for reaching out and, you know, inviting me to the podcast. And I think we both have a message, and I think that's one thing that when we both spoke, we both have similar values, and we both have a different, no, I'd say not different, but an aligned vision of, how we want to make more impact. So I'm glad that we can try and share this message in today's podcast. Brilliant stuff. I'm looking forward to it. Let's get started. Let's it, get started. So, Hodge, we've got a tradition on the podcast. And the very first question to you, my friend, is what does success actually mean to you? Well, throwing it right into the deep end. <laughs> so for me, success isn't about how much money you have in the bank account. For me, success defines being a person of value and worth. You see, if you become a person of value and worth, no matter what happens in life, you'll always be successful in your health, in your relationships, but more importantly, wealth. Because money will follow. Because if you're, in the, if you're in the industry of helping people overcome problems, being that person where they can count upon, that they can find value and worth from, guess what? You're really winning. You're really succeeding in this thing called life. So for me, success is being a person of worth and value. Amazing, amazing. And it's such a great answer as well, but let me, let me ask you this, right? Because a lot, you know, nine times out of 10, I get guests, you know, sat in this chair and ask them, you know, what does success mean to you? And pretty much every single person says, it's not about money, which is something that I can relate to, you know, but at the same time, you know, you're sitting there, you're broke, you haven't got any money, and someone is going, yeah, success is not about the money. It sounds like, well, it's all right for you. You know, you're, you're already there. So, you know, like, w w when you say it's not about money, like, what exactly do you mean? Okay, so if I take you back to my journey, right? Um, when I was broke, and trust me, I have been broke and on the clasp of losing everything. I was so trying to chase the money because I believed that money would solve everything. I mean, literally happiness, my life. So what I believe is that when you start chasing money, because that's what people start doing, they start getting desperate. They need money. The language that we tell ourselves is we need, 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 need. But we live in a time where everyone is just take, 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 take. 
So when you apply the same need, 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 take, 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 when are you ever going to give first? Because then that's a selfish way of approaching things. So when you start going, well, actually, yeah, you do need money to pay the bills, put food on the table, pay the electricity, but people can do that very easily. And I want to break that down as well, because people, in my personal opinion, are not being resourceful with what they have around them or what they have internally with them. Mm. So when you talk about being successful and chasing that need or chasing that bag, good. But let that be a driver. Don't let it be the be all and end all. Mm. Because you, my sir, have a bigger mission. You, people listening to this, have a bigger purpose. Money is just a byproduct of it. Mm. And I only got to understand that through my journey. Wow. Wow, amazing. And I really want to share that journey with the audience as well. But, you know, before we touch on that, you just said something then that, you know, it's probably going to open up some wins, right? You know, you're talking about people being resourceful and not being resourceful enough. Like, can you expand on that? What do you mean? So here's a perfect example, right? When people are going to buy something, they would find the money to buy that particular thing. But do they need it? Like brand new trainers. No, they don't need it, but it makes them look and feel good. Mm. So they will go and find the money to get it, even if they don't have the money. Mm. Ask friends, ask family. They'll go into overdraft, put in a credit card. See, people are looking for what I believe is the interim or the short-term wins, which is great. It, it, what I believe creates you just a little bit of success or a little bit of motivation for that little bit of time. But what about the big capacity that you need? See, that's where people are not going resourceful. They're only thinking now, but not in the future. Mm. And it's hard to think in the future, but you need to plan ahead. Because if you don't, no, if you don't play, if you don't plan to fail, you're going to fail to plan. Mm. And that's the problem with what people are doing. They're, they're failing in their plan. People have dreams. They want this big, lavish car. They want this big, lavish house. They want to go on to holidays. They want to go in private jets. They want to wear these lavish washes. They want to do all these great things. And the majority of people do want that. But why are they not achieving it? Mm. It's because their mindset's playing small time and they're not being resourceful, meaning they're not doing everything in their possible human being ability to figure out a solution to get what they need to or to get to where they need to get to. Well, that's so powerful. And I think you just, just kind of piggybacking off what you say there as well. It's, you know, if it's a pair of trainers or maybe a holiday, you know, people put their things on a credit card, you know, but it's about really prioritizing the things that you're willing to go to the to the end for. You know, if you're willing to actually go to the end for your own personal development and to actually invest in yourself and back yourself, then when you're looking at the ROI on those two things, you know, this is more long term. This is probably going to take six months, 12 months, 18 months, three years. You know, this instant gratification. I go on holiday today. The sun's, hit, sun's hitting me. You know, I'm in this beach. I'm sipping my pina colada. You know, but then once you get back, it's back to reality, right? And there is no ROI on that. That's now gone. Of course, holiday is a good thing. You know, we all need a break. Yep. But if you just invest that time, that that same level of investment, the time, energy, and even some of those resources that are used for the holiday over the longer period of time, then you can have more holidays in the future, right? And you get to make your own choices. And you said it perfectly there. Why don't people invest in themselves? Look at it. They're buying things which are external. They're buying a phone. They're buying trainers. They're buying a car. They're buying holidays. But like you said, they come back to reality, hits them like a ton of bricks because they got to go back into their nine to five or they might have to go back into their broke way of being. I'm just saying how it is because I've lived that life. I've gone on holiday, I've come back and gone back to reality now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. See, those should be a luxury off the back of what you're achieving. Mm. If you focus on yourself first, meaning what do you need to do to become a high value person? Mm -hmm. Remember I said at the beginning, can you be a person of value and worth? So what do I need to do to become a person of high value? Mm -hmm. You become a person of high value, which means investing in yourself. What do you need to attain knowledge, mentorship, coaching, skills, ability to level up? Not level up from one to two. You need to level up from one to ten. Mm. Because in this world, in business and life, you need energy. Mm. Most people are operating at a five out of ten when they wake out of bed. I wake up at a 10 out of 10. Mm. Because no matter what, our energy level is going to drop throughout the day. Mm -hmm. So if I wake up at a 10 and I drop to a 7, 
Isn't that better than waking up at five and dropping down to three by the end of the day? Mm. So what, and this is the problem, when, when you're not approaching that 10 out of 10, how could you possibly become resourceful? How could you possibly think outside the box? How could you possibly start going, what do I need to do to start making the dreams that I've been envisaging work? Wow, wow. So powerful, man. And so, so, so now let's get into it, you know, because... Okay, a lot of what we're talking about so far is really about mindsets, right? Mm, yeah. And it's a mindset of success. You know, sometimes it might come across a bit harsh, but it's just the realities of hanging around successful people, you know, being wildly successful yourself, just kind of understanding these are principles that are ultimately going to get you the results. And like you said, you know, our values are very much aligned. So I understand, you know, this is coming from a place of, you know, let's give so much value so people actually know what it takes. It's not about fluffy stuff, make you feel good. It's here's what it's really going to take for you to achieve what you want to achieve. So let's just understand the little bit more about your journey you know because i know you know today actually let's start with this right tell us a little bit about what you're doing now yeah and then we'll go back from where it all started <clears throat> perfect so right now um i've been privileged to be put myself in a situation where i own six businesses everything from um marketing company software company security uh health and safety you know i've got a charity in in my background in gambling and i've been able to achieve up to a seven figure businesses combined all for the pandemic. That's less than two years ago. Wow. So that's wow. something that I thought I never could do, but once again, applied a different mindset mm. everything's achievable wow incredible okay yeah so definitely we're going to need to talk about that <laughs> yeah because that's what you know once again we're talking long term but i mean that's happening in two years mm. so it's about the power of applying yourself yes you think long term but once you actually start putting those bricks on top of each other mm. things could actually happen a whole lot quicker than you could ever have envisioned yourself um so let's let's really kind of go back like first of all two years ago you've made this massive leap to two years later, you've now got a seven figure business. What were you doing prior to two years ago? Um, working in corporate. Okay. So um, if I rewind that, so um, growing up as a Sikh, as an Indian, I was always told to go to school, get an education. And if I go to university and do a degree in either Accountancy, finance, law, medicine, chemistry, doctorship, business, you know, the typical Indian degrees. <laughs> if I did something like philosophy or art, I would be shunned out of my, <laughs> out of my community. So I was always pushed into getting a good degree because if I got a good degree, I would get a good job. Mm -hmm. People know this, just over broke. Mm -hmm. And my mindset then was like, if I come out of here and get a job, as I actually went to university and studied law got my degree and I thought, well, if I carry in on this law journey, get a job, I'm on say 30, 40K a year, I'm married and I've got a house and I've got a nice car, I've made it in life. Mm. That's, that's what I grew up with. Mm. That's all I knew at that time. So basically uh, I left university, something happened and then I lost a lot of money, but then I went back into a corporate organization and I worked for some big tech companies. I worked for Kate Middleton's parents. I worked for some of the largest, actually the largest private jet brokerage in the world. So I was always really good at what I did, which was marketing and software. And I've always been fantastic at that. But some, when I lost the money from that particular thing, nothing still sat right. Can I ask you what, what that thing was? So when I left university, uh, I actually set up a, a, a basic website, very similar to Facebook. And it was just a, a community which has got students on it. I saw it happening in America, so I did it over here. Set up in 2007. In 2009, uh, I grew that to 165,000 subscribers. I went from meeting with a big media agency to talk about advertising, and they started talking about buying the company. I'm 23 years old, and they're looking to buy my company for multiple six figures. I'm living the dream. What did I say to you? I was thinking 30 grand a year, nice house, nice car, I've made it. Now I'm talking multiple six figures. No one in my life, my family, who I've ever met has done that. So I'm balling now. So I'm living the life. I've gone to start my company. And then it was one night in Birmingham where my life literally went downward in a massive spiral. 
So what did you did you sell the company? Yeah, sold the company. So you sold the company, and that then six figures. Six figures, and then what what ha- what mm-hmm. what happened after that? So you said multiple six figures. Do you mind like what was the number? It was. Just under two hundred thousand. Okay. Wow. Wow. At the age of twenty three. At twenty three years old. Bowling. <laughs> Bowling Bachelor. Out of control. <laughs> Single life. Yeah. Living in Birmingham. Yeah. Um, I. It's the things that you you just dream about. Yeah. Of course. I've of never course. seen that money in my life. Yeah. That's that's like almost I'm retiring. Yeah. At twenty three, right? One hundred eighty thousand pounds <laughs> sounds like a lot of money. Yeah. I'm now thinking like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Cool. So so now you're twenty three. You've got one hundred eighty G's in the bank. Like what? What happens next? So um, we went out on a night out with a couple of friends. Yeah, you know, I've got nothing to do. I'm just just chilling. So these guys said, "Look, we're gonna go out. We're gonna have a little party." Went to if anyone's been to Broad Street in Birmingham, it's a dive. <laughs> Stay the hell away from there. But that like, we went drinking, went clubbing, and then a couple of my friends said, "Look, let's go to a casino because you know they got drinks in there. They got some food in there. We can." You know, could just have a bit of a laugh, and I remember going. Well, I've, I've never stepped out of the casino. I, I let's go. I'm just enjoying life. And as I walked down, it's actually I'm not going to say I, I, I don't want you to get into trouble, but it was a very big known chain. And as I walked into the casino, I just remember this, just seeing these lights, hearing the noises of the roulette machine, the the games machine, just 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 people cheering, having a laugh. And the smell was just like, I've never experienced this. And as I went down, got my free sandwich, got some drinks, and I saw my mates placing a couple of bets. And they said, hey, why don't you try it? So playing blackjack, started off with 20 quid. I think it's about 40 minutes in playing into it. I've now got 60, 70 quid in my hand. My business brain game, 20 quid in, 60, 70 quid back. That's a bloody good return. I'm a genius. I'm a genius. <laughs> I've cracked the code. I now have to make money without working hard. <coughs> so um, I started gambling. And that's when it started. You know, I started. I had this like lucky streak for like almost three months. I was like, I'm indestructible. I'm, I'm literally taking money from these casinos. And some days I'd win a couple of grand. Some days I win a couple of hundred. But I was, I was never short falling. And then everything just flipped. And then I just kept chasing the money because the money that I'd made, I'd start When you said flipped, what, what would you mean? <clears throat> so my lucky streak ran out. And then I didn't know at the time because then every time I'd go in, I'd say maybe start with 100 quid, 100 quid would be spent, and then I'd go and put another 100 quid, that 100 quid would go, and then next I know I'm like spending like <clears throat> 300, 300, 400 quid a night. And I'm just chasing my tail, chasing my tail, chasing my tail. It got so bad within a year. So 2009 to 2010, I lost all the money from the acquisition of that company. Wow. That's how bad it got. The point where I couldn't see straight. I couldn't think straight. I couldn't see. It got to a point where, see, I've never experienced an addiction. Growing up, my father was an alcoholic. I've seen it, but I've never experienced it. And I, I was dumbfounding myself not to believe that I was an addict. But deep down I knew I was. So as I'm going through this period in my life, I'm thinking, how the hell have I got here? I remember sitting in my, in my flat in Birmingham. It must be about five o'clock in the morning. And the sun's just come up. I'm thinking, why me? How has this happened? And that was it, man. Broke my broke my heart and <coughs> had to go back home tell between my legs telling my parents I've fucked up and yeah man it's just wow oh, big pill to swallow yeah so. absolutely because like you said you've you kind of broken <coughs> the chains of your family history you're now the man at 23 you've gone out there you've cracked here you've you know you've you've built a business and sold a business for like you said multiple six figures so <laughs> And then what, what are we talking? How many months are we talking before you're, you're back home? Um, literally within weeks. Within weeks? Because I had no money. I, I mm. actually had zero in my bank account. And I had to jump the train to go home. So I couldn't pay for the flat. Couldn't pay for the rent. Couldn't pay for electricity. And I just remember going home, like, waiting in the toilets. So the conductor couldn't find me in the train. And I was like, damn, man, like, 
How I got here? What happened? Mm. Do you remember how you felt in those moments? <coughs> yeah, like a piece of shit. Failure. <clears throat> like, people would see me as like this hard, this happy-go-lucky person. And <clears throat> the more I kept being that person, the more I just tried to put a brave face on. But the, the thing with stuff like a gambling addiction, it's not like drugs or alcohol. <clears throat> you can't really see it. But you can hide it behind pressure. You can hide it behind difficulties. So no one knew I was going through this. So when I went back home to my parents, I said, look, I fucked up. Um, the money I made, I invested into applications. I invested in business. I lost it. Hmm. And look, no matter who you are, your mother would always welcome you back with open arms. Mm -hmm. So she did. And <clears throat> that's when I decided, look, I'm not going to go back into business. I want to restart my life and go back into corporate. No. Do, do, do you feel like, um, you said your dad was an <clears throat> alcoholic when you were growing up and had a, the addiction to alcohol. Yeah. Do, do, I, don't, I don't know, would you, I'm just trying to think of the best way to get the question across in the, in the right way. <clears throat> like, do you feel like that had some sort of impact on your addiction? <clears throat> or was was that affecting the way that you were processing things at all? 100%. Um, I've only really understood this more because I've got my therapy. And I've got f three brothers, two older, one younger. See, <clears throat> my life looked like this when I was young. When I say young, you're talking seven, eight, nine, as early as that. My mum would work nights at Asda. <clears throat> she would leave the house about, say, half four in the afternoon, late afternoon, go to work. My dad would get home about five, half five, <clears throat> stumbling, drunk, couldn't talk, by bed by six, half six. So you've got these seven, eight, nine year olds at home with no dad who's drunk. Mum's at work trying to provide. Like, we're running riots. We've got no sense of discipline, <laughs> no sense of time. We're running literally staying out for all hours and doing what not and no one's telling us right from wrong mm. <clears throat> so yeah so seeing my dad and seeing that chasing the drink and always wanting it and no matter how bad time Scott still chose drink over family over money over everything <clears throat> it did what people don't realise is that the environment that you set yourself around even from a young age it's what they call sponge years from zero to seven. You're constantly consuming things around you. You're absorbing environment. You're absorbing people. You're absorbing the way things people are doing. Which is why you have to be careful who you hang around and what you're opening yourself up to. Mm. So, yeah, man. You've got to be very careful in your environment. Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> And and so like at this point when you came home because you know you've gone home you told your mom yeah nah I was trying to grow businesses and I was buying this and buying that and it didn't quite work out so at this point are you aware of your addiction or is there still something in you that that's kind of <clears throat> not understanding this an addiction? Um, yeah, I was fully aware of the addiction. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I've always been a, quite a good talker. Um, I managed to blag my first job, um, paying me about thirty five grand a year. My brain's going, that 35 grand, if I put it into my gambling addiction, I can maybe make 100 grand. So it wasn't about the job paying me 35 grand. It was more of, I now have a job <clears throat> that can fuel my addiction. Mm. So you were, you were aware this is an addiction, but <clears throat> you were also willing to keep fueling it. Yeah. Like you were conscious <clears throat> of all of this. As soon as the money would come in mm. on payday. <clears throat> I'll be waiting at night time, ready with my online casino, waiting for the money to drop. It got so bad to a point where money would come in and even before I've gone to work on payday, I've lost it all. Within an hour. Think about it. Wake up, say six. From six to seven, I've gambled away maybe, say you're on 35 grand a year, <clears throat> that's close to about two grand. Two and a bit, all gone. Now I'm struggling to pay for meals, pay for petrol, get to work. I'm literally living. 
it got to a point I was just putting a pound in petrol in Tesco. Do you remember the Tesco petrol pumps? You mm-hmm. could, if you had a pound in your account, you could just acknowledge it with a pound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuel your car up. That would last me a month, and I'm good. Hundred pound, ninety nine pounds. I'm ninety nine pound yeah, max. Yeah, I'm yeah. good. And I had a Peugeot. I think it was a three O, wherever it was. But that kept me going for a month, man. But I put myself into that situation. <clears throat> then when money came around the next month, it would pay that petrol, and then whatever I was left with, boom, back down again. I don't think there was a time where I could. I got past a payday with actually having st- at least more than hundred pound in my account. How long was this going on for? From 2009 up until the 16th of June 2020. 12 wow. years. Bear in mind, I met my wife on a flight back from New York in 2012. We got married in 2014. She only got to know about my addiction properly in 2020. And how, how, how did you manage to, because you know, you got this money coming in by. 12, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, the money's all gone. Like, how did you manage to to keep that a secret? So, you just have to play the game. Talk about being resourceful, right? If you're an alcoholic, you're an addict, or some sort, they are the best entrepreneurs, in my personal opinion, because they can be the most resourceful people to get what they want. <clears throat> so my brain was like, right, cool, I'm married, I've got mortgage to pay, I've got bills to pay. So if I'm taking three grand, let's take all the money that I need to pay for that month. I might be left with, say, a grand in my account. Grand to the grand, to, that's a lot of money to gamble with, right? Mm-hmm. But then I could, you know, because I was looking after the money, basically. Typical Indian households, men try to look after the money. So I would, you know, pay some bets here and. Maybe now I was just, rather than doing it all in one day, I'd maybe do it over a couple of days and put stuff on credit card when I was going out with my missus and stuff like that. So I was, I was hiding stuff, but then I was going through all these emotional, like my oh, my physical health, my mental health, eating disorders, sleeping disorders. I mean, when I was like in a different world, I was in a different world. <clears throat> the great thing is that, I still say it's a great thing, but you can hide this. Oh, I'm stressed out of work. That's why I'm feeling like this. Oh, you're just pissing me off. I can hide these emotions mm. when I'm feeling these ways. With an alcoholic person or a person that does drugs, you can physically see that person not right. Mm. <clears throat> Gambling is a is Mental. one of the most fastest addictive behaviours happening right now. And it's one of the most hidden addictions out there. Wow. Because you can mask it so easily. Yeah, like it's it's you know from what you've said, you, you get kind of really creative with, you know, just how you, how you're kind of hiding things and you know making sure that you know people who are close to you don't really you know find out. Well, I, I would imagine that's also a lot of mental stress because you're not able to share this stuff with anyone. You're probably going through a lot of turmoil, but you're having to keep it, you know, within your own you know mental space. Like how how did you solve that? How did you deal with that? Um, you can divide your world if you want to. If you, the great thing about our mind, we have full control of it. We can choose what we want to do with it. So in one side of my brain or one part of my world, you would see Hajj, happy guy, got a family, married, people pleasing, living this life and so on the party Hajj. On the flip side, it's this dark, sinister, toxic relationship with gambling, feeling aloneness, abandonment, but still drawn to it. If you ever seen Stranger Things, <laughs> it's like the downward world. You know, you got the you got the normal world, and then you got the downside world. Like that's what it felt like. Mm. And no matter what happens, I was always drawn to the darkness. So, so I don't what, know why. what what happened in twenty twenty? <clears throat> um, I was getting ready for work. It was about eight o'clock in the morning, and we've just gone into lockdown. We're a couple of months in. So when I mean I'm going to work, I'm just getting ready in the morning, going to go and put my laptop on. And I come out of the shower. So did you did you not have a job at this point or were you working I from home? Working, I was working this time. Okay. But I was working from home. And um, I come out of the shower and it's about eight o'clock in the morning. And I remember it being really, really hot because we had a really great summer that year. And as I walked past my son's bedroom, I could hear him playing and laughing in his room. And 
I could walk to the room and I'd made coffee and I could smell the coffee lingering in the air as well. And I, I walked into my bedroom and I remember seeing my wife sitting at the edge of the bed. And she had her head down and she was crying. I mean, I've never seen my wife cry like this. And if everyone has has the privilege to have got to meet my wife, she's a strong, powerful woman with thick black curly hair. And something must have been wrong for her to cry like this. When I asked her what's wrong, what's happening, tell me what's going on. <clears throat> my heart dropped like that. Because what I'd seen is a phone in her hand. And it was my phone. And that moment of your heart sinking to your stomach, that's what it was at the moment. Because I didn't know what she saw, didn't know what she found. Because I was hiding a lot of things then. The demons always creep up, man. And she looked at me and goes, I can't believe you've done this to us. You said you'll never break my heart, you'd never cheat on me. I just feel like you've just broken my trust. And then she showed me the phone. And on this phone was a list of gambling transactions. And that's when she found out. And then she said to me, basically, we're getting a divorce. <clears throat> Get your shit, pack it up, go. No, I don't want you to see the kids. You fucked it up. You've broken my trust. You were this person that we depended upon and you, we can't depend on you anymore. See, the problem here is that I was always trying to chase the jackpot when the jackpot was sitting in front of me. My family, my children, my wife, this life I built. The... My wife was always trying to push me into the good side, but I was always letting <clears throat> my environments, people, situations control the better part of me. And I didn't realise until this all happened, unfolded. That's when I had to change. Because if I hadn't, I'm now risking losing everything. And I almost was, and almost am, at that moment. Well, well, powerful one. Thanks for sharing that. And like, so this situation's kind of happened. Um, what happened, like what, what, what happens next? So I had to beg and plead with missus to give me another chance. I mean, I literally knelt on the floor. I was begging just to give me another shot, another chance to make it up for her. And <clears throat> she said, well, look, the first thing you got to do if I'm going to stay with you, you've got to get professional help. <clears throat> I mean, therapy for your addiction. And I almost didn't. And I'll tell you why. Because as a man, we're told up to brush our emotion under the carpet, get on with it. There are people worse off than that in this world than you. So <clears throat> stop your shit, whinging, complaining, and just get on with life. That's all I've been told growing up. Get on with it. How can I get on with it when I can't understand what I'm getting on with? What am I facing? How am I facing these? What emotions am I going through? How can I possibly fix something that I don't even know what's going on? And my ego almost stopped me from doing it to save face. Because I didn't want people to think bad of me. I didn't want people to go, why is Harjan an addict? Why has this happened? Blah, blah, blah. Breaking this whole facade of like this perfect family. But I had to, if I wanted to keep my family. So that's when I decided to go and get professional help. And I did. I tried to, this is, I, I was going to ask my parents, ask my brothers, ask my friends. Problem here is that when I was going to go to any three of them, people or that environment, <clears throat> shame and guilt kicked in. Because these are the people that I begged, borrowed and stole from. Now they're going to know why. I reached out to my community, being Sikhs, um, and I thought they would help me. But they couldn't because they don't know how to help people with gambling addiction. Drugs, alcohol, yeah, they understood that. But they were chucking God's face down my neck, down my face. And <clears throat> I didn't need God at that time. I need to understand me. And that's a bad thing. And I say it's a bad thing now, but over time I've understood how my faith has come to play in this. Because some people say you need to be spiritual, but how can I be spiritual if I'm not in spirit with myself? Mm. Like, how can I look upon God when I felt I was blaming God for everything, family for everything. I was blaming everyone else apart from who? Me. So I went to a person, just literally Googled it online, I need professional help gambling. 
And then that's when I start my CBT therapy, the cognitive behavioral therapy, 12 week program. <clears throat> and I got out of it, you know, I started to understand, but it wasn't sustainable. It wasn't, it wasn't enough. Think about it. When you go to therapy, you expect this person to be lying on this couch or sitting on the couch like we're doing right now. And this person therapist talking to your emotions and helping you through. We're in a bloody pandemic. I'm in front of a computer screen at home. I had to dig deep. Deeper than I've ever done before. And that was hard. But I needed to do it. Why? Because my pain was driving my purpose now. Which is my family. Mm. And I've never put them first. Or myself first. So <clears throat> I did that. But then I'm thinking, well, if I do this, I'm going to come out of this therapy with nothing to show for it. No one's hiring because no one's, all these jobs are basically getting down the drain in the, in the pandemic. So I thought, well, I left university. I started a business, didn't I? So I know about business. How hard can it be? Why not take what I already know, marketing software and start a business? Mm. And then spoke to my wife. We sat down. I explained to her, a bit like Dragon said, actually. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> I need some money. Uh, but <laughs> 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 yeah. um, but it was, I had to explain and talk it through logically and emotionally. And we both came to a conclusion, well, this is the right path and we need to do this. So that's when I started my journey of entrepreneurship. And, and what business was that? that? I actually had a marketing software business, but... Since then, I split them out. Mm. <laughs> but um, I was good at those, right? I was good at software. I was good mm. at marketing. But um, I found that the software side, building bespoke pieces of software for people was going to be a good thing. And with this new fire in my belly, I went out there. I went out to the market. I was chasing clients, calling clients, emailing clients. I was doing everything I possibly could. Watching YouTube, reading books, Googling stuff. I was doing everything I could to make myself a success. I was trying to get as resourceful as possible. And as much as I tried to do everything, I still wasn't landing clients. However, one day, I had one opportunity. You know, have you ever had that? Like where you've got one opportunity where you're going, this is make or break. Mm -hmm. That was me on the 18th of August, 2020. I went to this meeting in Nottingham. I, on the way there, I'm rehearsing everything, breaking everything down. Went to this meeting and I smashed it. I mean, absolutely annihilated this meeting. I mean, I did freaking amazing warm weather sunny weather just like we've got outside at the moment and then at the end of the meeting the guy goes Haj we love this but oh, that now that but that just drops everything mm. and I remember the room turning grey and everything just went cold how was it it was sunny outside and warm they said Haj we like what you've got to offer but I think we're going to stick with the people that we've got and then going home, I actually delayed going home because I felt like a failure. I was like, this is, what can I do now? I've let my family down. I've let myself down. I've tried to make it. I pinned my hopes onto this meeting. It didn't go the way I wanted. And I delayed going home that day because I couldn't face seeing my family and looking at the disappointment. And I'm driving home. I thought, right, about 10, 11 o'clock at night. I'm driving home, Nottingham. I'm on the M1 near Leicester. And I'm replaying, what did I go wrong? Where did I go wrong? How has this happened? Why have I put myself in a situation? Why do I feel like a failure? Why do I deserve my children, my family to be with me? And it all got on top of me. And that's when I decided to go and crash my car. 80, 85 miles per hour, third lane, turn the steering wheel, no seatbelt on, just decided to let it go. Why? Because why does this world need someone like me in it? Why do my children need to see failure of a father? That's what I felt at the moment. I couldn't, <clears throat> I couldn't face up to these moments. I'm not man enough to face up to these moments. How can I possibly be the person that they need me to be if I can't be the person that I need me to be? So I called it. I remember not caring if I woke up or if I died. But obviously, I'm here, so I did wake up. And <clears throat> I'm in a daze, but I can hear my son. 
His name's Jeevan. He's two year old at the time. Almost calling me. <clears throat> or I could see him. And the great, crazy thing about the accident is I walked out of that with no broken bones, no serious injuries, just a few cuts and bruises. So what does that tell you? That's an act of God. Even the paramedics, when they came on scene, they go, where's the driver? I'm here talking to you, looking at you. They looked at me, looked at the car, looked at me, looked at the car. They said, sir, you should not be standing there right now. If you don't believe anything or higher power, start believing because you, sir, are lucky. And it still didn't hit me at that moment. Yeah, I didn't feel lucky. How did you feel? Lost. Even more lost than I was before. But it was only until two days after. I was with my son. It's such a weird thing. Everything started happening. Everything. Just, I, this is crazy. I've had an accident. I'm going straight back into work. Wife's telling me not to do it. I'm not, I have to provide. I have to do something. I have to make something work. My, I'm just masking out the pain. Getting rid of everything. Going, do you know what? I've got to make this work. I have no other option to make this work. I'm getting calls from people that I emailed before. They started calling me. I got overwhelmed. <clears throat> it got to a point where I just didn't know what, I couldn't think straight. So I said to my son, Let, let's get out of here. I took my wife's car, went for a drive, and we ended up in McDonald's in a drive through because my son, two year old, wanted chips. And he said, Dad, I just want chips. I just got him some chips. And then it was at that moment, my son turned to me and he said, As he bit this warm chip, he said, Dad, a two-year-old. Dad, I'm the luckiest boy alive. That moment there defined why I need to do what I need to do. See, I made a promise to myself never to let myself down because I can never let my children down or my family down. That's when I found my purpose. That's when I knew what I need to do. So then, with this whole different state, emotional change, everything, I then... Almost was about to pack it in until I decided to do the one thing that I never thought about doing, which is actually something I did before, which is ask for help through my therapy. Why are there successful people out there, Ibrahim? There are successful entrepreneurs in property, in business, in any industry. So when people say, oh, I'm, this industry is not profitable or bullshit, any industry is profitable. There are successful people in any industry. Why? It's because they've got a something that you haven't. So why not learn from them? So put away the books, put away YouTube, put away Google and actually start speaking to people that actually are doing what you're doing in whatever industry you're doing and that are still doing it and smashing it. And that's what I did. I went out and got mentorship. <clears throat> See, I wasted a quarter of a million pound on gambling. Quarter of a million. And now I'm saying to my wife, I need more money to invest in my knowledge so I can start a business. That's freaking loopy, right? Who in the right mind is going to back that? Would you back me as a wife? As a partner? Maybe not. Majority of women won't. So, yeah man. That's when I decided to go fuck it, start my business as an entrepreneur. Like, how, how, how did that make you feel? Like, you know, what, what you've just kind of expressed there. Um, I mean, first of all, when you got back that night after the crash, did you explain to your wife what happened? I had to. You had to, okay. So I, exp I explained everything, but I, this time I, I fully opened up. Because mm. you have to lay your cards out on the table. If you want to achieve anything, you have to almost start from ground zero. What was that moment like? <clears throat> it was a big sense of relief, but also a big sense of guilt. But the guilt was only the bullshit story I tell myself. Because I was presuming my wife felt a certain way. I was presuming people were feeling this way. It's not... It's the made-up stories I'm telling myself. So I then got rid of the guilt and started focusing on the relief and started saying, well, actually, I'm, I'm in a good place now. My emotional shift, everything shifted. But I needed that to go ahead and journey in, in this entrepreneurship game. So when I then decided to get my entrepreneurship, you know, retrain myself as an entrepreneur, understand the successful ways of running a business, how to operate it, what makes them tick, what makes someone successful? Why businesses fail? Once I fully understood what I believe are the seven principles, game changed. Mm. 
That's brilliant. I'm, I'm going to come back to another point, but just to go back to when you delivered that message to your wife, you had a huge sense of relief. How did she feel? Happy about it. Because I'm communicating. Wow. I'm talking about it. When I say happy about it, it was more of a sense that I'm glad you're talking to me about it. Mm. Which I presume is a happy situation. It mm. might not have been, but I'm at least feeling what I felt in that moment. Mm. Because for such a long time, I hid so much from her. But now I'm not, I don't, you can ask my wife. I believe there's <clears throat> very little or anything to lie about. Mm. So now we run an open book policy. We don't have to lie about anything. We don't need to lie about anything. But when I opened up, she understood where I was coming from. It's the first time she understood where I was coming from. So she can understand what we need to do next. Brilliant. That actually helps me with the other question because the other question I was going to say is, you know, you've, you've you laid it out perfectly. You said you've gambled away £250,000. You know, you, you almost kind of killed yourself. And then, you know, you're coming back and going, hey, I need some money to go and invest in some more knowledge. And like, you know, like, how, how did you feel when she actually just said yes? Good. I mean, actually, I felt like a team. That's the word. I felt like a team. Like, I've now got support that I need and we're supporting each other on each other's journey. When you've got support and you've got someone that's fighting your corner, I don't care where you are in life. We all need someone to support each other. Mm. You can't go in life on your own. It's, it's undoable and it's unachievable and it's not sustainable. You need people, whether it's a partner, a wife, friends, family that are doing something very similar to you, that are on the same trajectory, that are on the same wavelength as you, vibrations as you, that can support you in your mission moving forward. Oh. So we felt good that we're now working as a team. That was beautiful, man. That was beautiful. Your wife is a, is a special person. 100%. Yeah, amazing. Okay, cool. So, you know, now you've, you've got this money, you're like, oh, we're a team, right? So you, you've invested in yourself now. Like, what, what happens next? So... <clears throat> to be honest with you, I just focused on what I was good at. Making money in a business. Spending money or keeping money, I'm shit. My wife's good at that. So now she up schooled her knowledge in how to do better investments. Mm. So now we're making money work for money. So I decided that if I really want to be successful, my marketing business and software business needs to grow. So then I go, well, actually, this is the power of community and conversations. Through conversation I had, I was open, I was able to open up like a two and a half million pound contract over five years through a conversation. I didn't know anything about it, but guess what? I'll bloody make sure I can get myself to understand it. I can get people around me to make me understand it. I can get a team to employ to make it better. I don't need to be the person that needs to do everything. If I can see a vision of how this can work, I will get people because I'm thinking two and a half million pound contract, what's my baseline? How's my mom going to remember? I've learned this time business. If you can work out what I believe, the vision, the operation, the marketing, if you get the trifecta perfectly nailed, any business you do will fly, mm. in my personal opinion. It's what I've built my business on. Mm. So I went from one business, split that to two businesses, now six businesses, and <coughs> I kept growing, 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 growing. I'm at seven figures, but I'm not stopping there. Why? Because when you've teetered on death's doorstep and you've danced on death's doorstep, why should you stop yourself? You're doing a disservice to yourself if you're stopping your dreams. And dreams don't cost anything, by the way, so stop dreaming a little. So if I can achieve this, and my brain's going now, what can I possibly do in the next three years to get to myself 10 million plus? Well, I'd have, have some conversation with people. Go into an environment, go into my community, go into my network. You talk about this. Mm -hmm. Your network is your net worth, right? Mm -hmm. And I've got a team, I've got people around me that can do that. However, I needed to shift something. We were speaking about this before, right? How can I build that? It's actually a different perspective from someone that talked to me that made me change everything that I need to do in my business to get to 10 figures. Well, what I need to do to get to 10 figures. Mm. <clears throat> And and like what would what would you say now, right? Because this is growth that's really happened in the last two years, right? Which is really quite phenomenal. So what would you say if you were now giving some, you know, advice to 
I'm trying to think of what age Hodge we should be talking about. But, you know, the younger version of yourself, you know, knowing everything that you know now, what advice would you have given to yourself you know, when you were younger? I would look back at what I was always doing for other people, <clears throat> living on their terms, trying to do this, trying to... I would look at what I was doing for other people, not for myself. Mm. And then ask myself, how do I stop that? But more importantly, am I still doing that in my present self? What do you mean? So for an example, if I turn back my time and I said, you know, Hard is always the life and soul of the party, but he was doing things for other people to make other people happy. Fast forward to the present Hajj. Am I doing that now? No. But if I was, why have I not changed? Most people think back to the future. Well, actually go back and they go, well, I was doing this. And some people still run the same patterns. Stop. Mm. You have a choice. So my thing here is, stop living life on other people's terms. You have the ability to live the life that you want, not for other people. So what I would have done is, Stop gambling, invested in myself, and started hanging around different set of people. Got rid of the toxicity in my life. Okay. So the question I would ask you is, is how? So one, toxicity to understand environments, journaling. 30 days, do a journal. If you're happy, sad, angry, you know, laughing, I want you to write down each one of those moments. Each one of those moments, I want you to put down where you are. I want you to put a date and time. And then I want you to say, are you with certain people? And then I want you to write down out of a one to 10 rating, let's say happy, are you one or zero, not happy at all? Or 10, like over the moon ecstatic happy. The power of journaling can unveil secrets that you don't even know. You mm. see patterns. Journaling allowed me to see toxic people and toxic environments. Once I eradicated that, what have I got? Positivity, happiness and people that I want to hang around with. Mm. Second thing, I talked about people pleasing. Start understanding that by people pleasing, they're only people that are winning. You're only fueling their, it, you're fueling their life, you're fueling their emotions and you're allowing them to win, not yourself. So be on the side of cause, not effect. Cause mean take responsibility for whatever's happening in your life right now and make a choice, which is this. Live life on your terms. The time that we have is borrowed. It's not infinite. Mm. So do yourself a favour. Use this borrowed time that you have to make the biggest impact for you. Wow. Wow, wow, powerful man. Like that's been honestly so, so incredible. I'm just sitting there just taking a lot of notes. But yeah, journaling for one is something that's had a huge, huge, huge um impact on my life as well. So I you know, I know, you know, I can definitely second that. The power of journaling just it's like call it like self therapy. Yeah. And because you're doing it consistently, nothing stays there. Everything is out. You're able to really, as you're writing it out, you're processing it, you're asking questions, you're answering the questions, yep. right? But everything just coming out of your head and going down on that paper. And, you know, by the time you finish, you kind of, even if you, you haven't taken all the weight off your shoulders, you understand it a bit more. And you say, like, okay, cool, I get it. Like, I'll try not to do this today. I'll try, you know, what kind of trigger that? Because it's, it's very present. It's when you leave things on and things kind of compound, compound. Sometimes you actually forget what, is making you feel this way, yep. right? And then you don't know how to deal with it. But when you're dealing with these things on a daily basis, you're really able to deal with things, you know, a lot more clearly. I totally agree. Because yeah. people are living in logical state, not emotional state. Mm, absolutely. Wow. So, man. so the last thing I would say is one other thing I would do <clears throat> is um, if you've got a dream or you've got an ambition or you want more success instantly, effortlessly and abundantly, you need a plan because dreams only dreams without actually implementation and having a plan. And I broke this down to three things. So one, be clear. Be clear on your path of success. People would say, oh, there's a barrier, there's a barrier. Stop focusing on the barriers because every time you focus on a barrier, you're going to put a barrier there. Mm. You're going to manifest it. So have a clear vision of path. Secondly, be congruent, meaning be comfortable with what you're talking to yourself about. 
and what you're doing. Some people are starting businesses that they're not even comfortable with. Learn, stick to what you already know and be comfortable with what you're doing. And then the third thing is commit. Because once you commit, the consistency will allow you to allow, your consistency will allow you to commit your purpose of moving your vision forward. Mm. Wow. So they're the three definitions. Be clear, be congruent and be committed. Wow. Powerful one, powerful. Can't believe this is coming to the end, right? <laughs> um, but we've got a, a final question for you because look, like the last two years, you know, have really been phenomenal. You know, you've gone on to achieve some absolutely incredible things. You know, and I know for sure they're not they're not stopping now. You know, like you said, it's like how do I get to the next 10 million? Yep. And then 20 million and then kind of move things on. So like today, with everything that you've now achieved, like what is your need to succeed? I want my need to succeed is having more time to look for opportunities. Mm. So if you're in <clears throat> so if you're a business owner right now and you're listening to this and you're working in a business that relies upon you, you have a business that's liability and on asset, which means I've been building my businesses around business functions and not around me. That means no matter what happens, the businesses always go. They'll always work which means I then have more time to look more opportunities. I spoke to you about this. Remember, mm -hmm. my billionaire friend, he was saying, look, in order for you to make time work for you, work 15 hours a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, five hours a day. Use Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday to explore new opportunities. Once you've got those, then you've got the Monday to start looking at how to start implementing, but then you've got Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday with your team to figure out a solution of how to make those opportunities work. So for my need to succeed is to find more opportunities, whether that's um, acquisitions, whether that's JVs, whether that's marketing, whether that's building a team, processes. My need to succeed is to elevate my self-being and my self-worth through my businesses and my family. Wow, wow. How's it going? <laughs> Thank you very much, my brother. As always, a pleasure, bro. Amazing, mate.